My name is Michelle McArdle. I am one of the transplant financial coordinators at the University of Utah Hospital. I've been in this position for, I think, going on five years now. So um, we're going to go over financial aspects of transplant. So the first thing with insurance, you'll want to know your policy, both the medical and the pharmaceutical uh, coverage. Um, get a copy of your insurance policy from your commercial plan if you have a commercial plan. If you have a government plan such as TRICARE, Medicare, Medicaid, you're probably not going to want a full policy because it may be a thousand pages. <laughs> um, if you have a commercial insurance, you're also going to have a nurse case manager. Um, this person will be the kind of the main liaison between the hospital and your insurance. So we work with that person to get your insurance to approve uh, transplants. Um, but basically, be your own expert and ask as many questions as possible. So insurance terminology, a lot of these terms you guys are familiar with, some of them you're not. Um, deductible, this is an amount that you're going to pay before your insurance starts paying anything towards your, your uh, procedures. Copay, typically you have a copay when you meet with your physician, whether it's primary care physician or a specialist. Some people have a copay when they go into the emergency room, and on occasion you'll also have a copayment per admission or per day that you're actually in the hospital. So you'll want to check that. Coinsurance, this is the percentage that you pay versus the percentage that your insurance pays. Usually it's an 80% policy where your insurance pays 80%, you pay 20%. And then um, your out-of-pocket maximum, this is kind of your best friend for transplant. Whatever your out-of-pocket maximum is, is truly the amount that you're going to pay during a one-year period of time, uh, whether it's a calendar year or fiscal from July through June, or some people are on a, on a school year policy where their policy starts September. So you want to find out when your policy begins each year, and then the out-of-pocket maximum. That's the amount that once you hit that amount, your insurance covers it 100%. So realistically, that's what you'll end up paying for transplant. Annual maximum. Um, we used to have lifetime maximums. And with the new Obama health care reform, they've uh, eliminated the lifetime maximums. This is really good for transplant patients in particular. This was an amount that your insurance allowed you to have. And once you reach the lifetime maximum, you lose your insurance. They've gotten rid of that. And now we have an annual maximum. This is not on every policy, but some policies have an amount that they will allow you to have during one year. And most of the time, it's like a $2 million or annual maximum. Um, on occasion, it's going to be less, but we will check that. Um, transplant maximum, some insurance policies actually have an amount that they allow for the transplant. Uh, so if they say you have a $250,000 transplant maximum, that means that once that $250,000 is used up, Everything beyond that is your responsibility. We don't see this too often. There are a couple of insurance groups that, that do have this consistently, but we'll let you know if you have that and, and we'll work with you. Medication coverage, you're, you may have the exact same terms. Um, one trend that we're seeing across the country right now is a, a lot of medication or prescription coverage <clears throat> plans were using co-payment structures and now they've switched to co-insurance. So if you were paying like $20 for brand name drugs and they switched to a 20% co-insurance, now all of a sudden instead of paying $20, you might be paying $200. So it's really important that you always pay attention to your prescription benefits and make sure that you understand that if they switch over to a co-insurance, you need to understand that you may actually end up paying quite a bit more. Um, when they do have a co-insurance uh, plan, usually they also have, a, have a, an out-of-pocket maximum as well. So you may only pay like 4000 for the year for medications, but you definitely want to know that. Some of the other um, terms that you may not be quite as familiar with, organ acquisition and procurement. This is actually the cost of uh, getting a deceased donor organ from point A to point B. So if a, an organ, if a heart, for example, is available in California, somebody has to get that heart. Here locally, we use Intermountain Donor Services. They are the um, organ procurement uh, nonprofit organization that actually goes in and gets the organ. They take their uh, planes, they have their surgeons, um, and our surgeon may go with them, but they'll go in and, and procure that heart and then bring it back to you. So we do have to make sure that your insurance covers the cost of that. 
um, professional fees versus facility fees. Um, the, the professionals are anyone with an MD after their name, anesthesiologist, radiologist, the surgeon. These guys have their own billing system. Uh, the facility is the hospital. We now have one billing system here at our hospital so that hopefully you get one bill and you have line items that say, okay, you're going to owe Dr. Sorensen this amount and, and the hospital this amount. Uh, that's not always the case. Some hospitals still use two different billing systems. Uh, travel and lodging, if you are from outside of the immediate area of the Wasatch Front, you may qualify for some travel and lodging assistance from your insurance plan. Uh, so if you've got that plan, it's usually a limited benefit, it's usually a reimbursement only benefit, and you have to keep the receipts and then send them in. You'll have a nurse case manager that you'll work with and, and make sure that you get those receipts to that person. Some plans actually give you a kind of a, a prepaid visa card and they say, okay, you've got $10,000 total, but you can only use $200 per day and use the visa just as you would any other visa, but it can only be used for hotels, lodging, and uh, gas and, and whatnot, airfare. So do you have any questions about the terminology? Good. Um, Medicare. Three reasons why people qualify for Medicare. Uh, first and most common is age. If you are 65 and over, you are automatically entitled to Medicare if you've paid into Social Security. Um, the second is disability. If you are deemed disabled by Social Security, not by your doctor, but by Social Security, um, then you qualify for Medicare after you have been disabled for two full years. Um, and, and with age and Medicare, you never lose or age and age and disability, you never lose Medicare. Uh, the third is end-stage renal disease, and you guys are not um, kidney patients, but a lot of you guys will ask, why do kidney patients get Medicare and we don't um, automatically? Kidney patients get qualify for Medicare if they are on dialysis or once they receive a kidney transplant. The difference is they lose Medicare after three, three years after the transplant. and. Um, and all three of these, age, disability, and, and end-stage renal disease, require that you have worked and paid into Social Security in order to qualify. Medicare cards, as you guys can see, have the name of the beneficiary. One thing that I like to point out that's very important, if this card says Jane Doe, when I go to a hospital or a doctor's office and register and I put Jane Doe, that's fine. If I put Jane Michelle Doe, that's fine. If my name is Michelle Jane Doe and I register as Michelle Doe and I leave out the Jane, Medicare may not pay. So you need to look at your Medicare card and whatever is on that card, that's how you need to register. And the kind of the rule of thumb is you can always add to your registration, but you can never uh, remove any part of the, of the name. So um, if you have questions about your name, contact Social Security to get that changed. Same with the sex on your card, something that's so simple, make sure that you have the correct sex on your card. Um, your Medicare claim number is typically your social security number, sometimes a spouse's, on occasion a, a parent's social security number, and then a letter either at the beginning or at the end of the uh, claim number, and that letter signifies something. There are like 30 different uh, letter combinations that you can have, so typically A at the end means age or um, permanent disability, <clears throat> um, but you'll just have to look at that. And then it's going to tell you if you're entitled to parts A and B and, and the effective dates. Um, so there are uh, a few different parts to Medicare. And Medicare Part A, this is inpatient uh, hospital care, skilled nursing, home health, and hospice. The, I, I like to call this anything 24 hours or more would be billed under Medicare Part A. So if you have your gallbladder removed and you're in for 23 hours, that does not go under Medicare Part A, that goes under Medicare Part B. Um, Medicare Part B is doctor services, anything outpatient, um, preventative services, diagnostic testing, some therapies, durable medical equipment, and most important for transplant recipients is immunosuppressant drugs fall under Medicare Part B if you have Medicare at the time of transplant. Okay. Um, Part C, this, these are Medicare Advantage plans or replacement plans. These are uh, commercial insurance companies that you are receiving your Medicare benefits through. Uh, they deal with Medicare, so you don't. Um, 
And typically you only see these for people that are age or disabled, um, not for end-stage renal disease. These uh, plans are a little bit different. We, we kind of refer to Medicare Part A and B as traditional Medicare, and Part C, the Medicare Advantage plans, we refer to as commercial Medicare. Um, there are a lot of differences between the two. Uh, sometimes you have to have a prior authorization with the commercial plans, whereas with traditional Medicare you don't. Um, the benefits are, are there, they're just uh, billed differently and um, there are some little quirks that you might want to read all the fine print if you have a Medicare Advantage plan. Especially with immunosuppressant drugs, you may end up paying a little more, um, and, uh, but some of them are really good. Sometimes you don't have any co-payments at all when you go into the doctor's office but just read all of the fine print before you elect to pick a uh, Medicare Advantage plan. And then Part D, these are the Medicare prescription drug plans. These are for the prescriptions that are not considered immunosuppressants. So any um, outpatient prescription drugs, and uh, I mean if you're on heart medication, cholesterol, um, antibiotics, anything like that's gonna go under, under Part D. Um, you are not required to get Medicare Part D if your commercial insurance plan has a prescription benefit that's equal to or better than what Medicare can offer through Part Ds. But you can be, um, you can end up paying more on Medicare Part D if, uh, if you don't elect it when you originally get Medicare. <clears throat> so expenses for Medicare, Part A, this is what you're automatically entitled to when you get Medicare. Um, there's a $1,068 deductible for this year, 2011. And um, that is good through the first 60 days in the hospital. Anything above and beyond 60 days, you may have a daily copay as well. Um, hopefully you're not in the hospital for more than 60 days. And the 60 days is a rolling cycle. So if you're in the hospital and then you get out and then you go back in before that 60 day time frame is up, you may end up paying, or that will apply to this deductible. Once you're out of the hospital for 60 days completely, Medicare Part A, rolls over and then you have a new deductible, okay? Um, part B, this you actually pay for. Uh, there is a monthly premium, typically it's about $104. Uh, some people pay a little more, it's based on your income. And Part B, the deductible um, is $162 for this year. Everything is covered at 80% and you pay 20%. There's no out-of-pocket maximum, it's just straight across uh, 20%. And then, um, the uh, Part D drugs, uh, the copay is varied depending on which plan you elect. There are 52 different plans in Utah and Idaho. There are some other plans in other states. 11 of the plans are good in 48 states. Uh, 10 of them are good in all 50 states. And then the other, you know, uh, 30 or you have to just use in Utah or Idaho. And, or if you live in Nevada, you would have to get one that's good in Nevada. Um, the most important thing with this is uh, if you travel a lot, make sure you have your medications before you go out of town. So, um, Travel benefits, we kind of went over this a little bit, but some insurance companies offer a limited travel benefit and uh, it's reimbursement and you'll need to contact your insurance to find out about that, okay? VA benefits, um, if you served in the military and you uh, served overseas or during wartime, you may have potential to um, get benefits through the VA. If you need a transplant and you've served in the military, you may actually be covered at 100% through the VA. You would have to go to a VA hospital for uh, transplant. However, it's important to uh, enroll in the VA benefit plan if you have it, even if you are gonna stay here in Utah and, and um, that, that can eliminate some of the costs of your medications. You can get medications through the VA and it may be cheaper for you. So if you have served in the military, please let us know so that we can uh, work with you on getting some VA benefits. So <clears throat> this is um, not too pertinent to you guys right now. Um, it's when, once you're billed, sometimes you have global billing and um, depending on your insurance company, you're going to have uh, a regular billing or you may have something called global billing. A lot of insurance companies, commercial insurance companies, use kind of a third party to um, do all of their billing. And uh, a big one I'm going to use is Cigna. I'm just gonna give, these are samples of, of insurance companies that we use on a regular basis here. 
but Cigna is a very big company across the United States. And for transplants specifically, they use a third party company, which they also own, called LifeSource. So anything transplant related, when you're coming in for the evaluation, and then once you're transplanted, everything is billed to LifeSource, and then Cigna deals with the paying. And the, the way the bills are uh, sent out, you get kind of lump sum bills. So it'll, it'll give you a line item of everything that you've had done. But one, when you see the bill, you may just see like one amount. And, uh, and that's because LifeSource is going to pay that to us. We have a contract with LifeSource. And then they pay Cigna, Cigna pays them. Anyhow, so um, I don't know that that's going to be very important to you guys. Um, but do you have any questions about global versus uh, insurance contracts? Okay. Medicaid. Medicaid is a state-funded medical program. Um, these are based for families with limited income with children. Um, if you are receiving supplemental income because you're disabled but you do not qualify for Medicare because you haven't waited the two years yet, sometimes you can uh, get onto the state Medicaid. Certain people with um, uh, pregnant women, sorry, pregnant women without any insurance are automatically entitled to uh, Medicaid. And then if you're a foster child, going through the state system, even if you'll qualify for Medicaid, even if you've been adopted out or placed in a home and that family has insurance, foster children will still maintain Medicaid um, until they're 18 right now. So, um, Fundraising, we talk to all of our patients about fundraising regardless of whether or not you're rich or poor, have insurance, don't have insurance, it doesn't matter. Um, the most important thing that we can tell you is if you do any sort of fundraising, you have to pay taxes on that, on those funds that you raise. Uh, so we recommend going through nonprofit organizations. They file the tax bracket in the IRS tax code 501c3. A couple of these organizations that we work with um, that are very specific to transplant, um, well, I have three that we work with in the, in the US. National Transplant Assistance Fund, um, we have their website, their 1-800 number available. Um, and these are just kind of some inf information uh, that um, the NTAF has actually put on their website and, and I copied it. Copied it. <coughs> so NTAF, they have been doing this for about 40 years now. Uh, they take a percentage of whatever amount you raise, however um, it's less than, than the paying taxes. Taxes that are about 6.8%, I think they keep 5% of whatever you raise. Um, so I recommend looking into NTAF. The next one is NFT, not to be confused, they're very similar. National Foundation for Transplants. These guys also have been around for about 40 years. These are all kind of small mom and pop uh, nonprofit organizations. They're not there to make a, a huge profit. They're there to help transplant patients specifically. Um, and. Uh, these guys, like NTAF, um, they keep a percentage. They keep four or five percent up to a certain amount, still smaller than what you would pay in, in um, taxes. One thing that's really important about this, if you go through a nonprofit organization when you're fundraising, uh, because they're considered a nonprofit, it's a tax write-off. So if I want to donate to your fundraising account, it's a tax write-off for myself. So of course, that's more incentive for me to donate than rather just give you money to put in your bank account, number one. Number two, um, if I work for a company that's a, um, a, a, now I've lost my train of thought, Rochelle. Um, it's one of the companies, a, they, matching, there's the word, <laughs> matching. If I work for a matching company and I donate money to one of these organizations, the company I work for will also match what I have offered. Some companies do like one and a half times. Um, and so you may actually earn more by getting money from your friends that work for bigger corporations. Um, so it's definitely to your benefit. And then the uh, third organization is CODA, the Children's Organ, is Organ Transplant Association. CODA is specifically for patients that are 21 and under and um, people with uh, cystic fibrosis. They can be over 21, but if they have cystic fibrosis, um, they can fundraise with CODA. CODA does not take any percentage, um, and uh, they're really there for the kids. And the same thing, they're a nonprofit. Um, you can give money to them, and your company can match, and everything else. So 
Um, so that's fundraising. Do you guys have any questions about fundraising? We recommend it, even if you're rich. It's always good to have kind of a security plan 10 years down the road in case you lose your job, get laid off. If something happens, then you can uh, dip into that fundraising account. Um, Kurt Oscarson Foundation, this is something very specific to Utah. Kurt Oscarson Foundation was created in 1992 to provide financial assistance for children needing organ transplants who are residents of the state of Utah. Um, they are a Utah State Tax Charitable Fund. They're also a nonprofit. Um, children can apply for a grant up to $10,000. It's based on your parents' income, so it could be considered a grant or a loan that you have to pay back later on. Um, but it's good. Once you get that $10,000, you get to keep it for the rest of your life. Um, so when kids turn 26 and lose insurance, sometimes it's good they have this fund that they can dip into if they're, you know, in between jobs or going from their parents' insurance to a, a regular insurance plan. Um, Kurt Oscarson, when you guys do your Utah State tax uh, taxes every year, when you, it asks you, would you like to donate to these things? There is, the Kurt, the Kurt Oscarson Foundation is on there and you can contribute if you want to that way. That's where their money comes from, from um, contributions from the state uh, residents. So, organ donors, um, this is more specific for our kidney patients. Um, if you are a kidney patient and um, you're considering a live donor um, transplant, the donor transplant expenses are covered under the recipient's insurance. When a, or when a donor is being tested, all of the testing that we do, our, in, our transplant clinic pays for their testing. Once the transplant is actually scheduled and takes place, at that time, the uh, transplant is paid under the recipient's insurance. Okay, so um, we can arrange to have testing done at other facilities. It doesn't have to be here at the University of Utah Medical Center. We can, if you've got a cousin that lives in Georgia that wants to donate, we can actually have testing arranged to see if that person is a match in, at a hospital locally for them and get all of the results so that the patient doesn't have to come here until the time of transplant. So it's very nice. Um, very important, Family Medical Leave Act. Um, this is, or FMLA. This, um, this is something that as a transplant recipient, if you are currently working or if your spouse is the recipient um, and you're gonna have to take some time off for work because of the transplant, you always want to check with your, your employer and make sure that you have signed your FMLA paperwork. This is, um, FMLA falls under the U.S. Department of Labor and basically this allows you to take up to 12 weeks of time off per year for anything related to your medical or your family uh, medical. Usually you hear this with pregnant women um, when they're having birth they take FMLA but you can actually use this for transplant or if your spouse is getting a transplant you can use this to take care of your spouse. So any serious health condition or uh, care for a family member with a serious health condition. So make sure you fill that paperwork out. If you fill it out, you are covered by federal law. Your employer cannot terminate you during that time. Um, they can lay you off if the company is having a company-wide layoff, but they can't just single you out because you're sick and, and lay you off or terminate you. Um, so it's really important that you fill that out. And you're entitled to that every year for up to 12 weeks. So. Um, Short-term disability, um, some, some in companies offer short-term disability. Uh, there's a maximum cap allowed on this time. Uh, there's a maximum cap on the amount paid and it's based on your employer whether or not they offer short-term disability. Here, where we work, we were not offered short-term disability until this year. It's the first time we've ever been offered short-term disability. Something you have to pay into so you'll need to check with your human resources to make sure you have it. Long-term disability um, usually kicks in after short-term or after FMLA, for example. Uh, usually there's a waiting period of 90 days. Um, there's a maximum benefit per month. And usually you receive 62.5% of your regular salary while you're on long-term disability. And you could stay on long-term disability until you reach 65. At that point, you're entitled to uh, Social Security if you've paid into Social Security and, uh, and they terminate the long-term disability plan. Again, it's something you have to pay into, and um, it's very important that you check with your human resources. Um, even if you're healthy, you should, you know, for those of you that are uh, spouses or, or employers, you should definitely check um, with your HR. 
COBRA, um, this is the Consolidated Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act. Uh, this is something that you can apply for after you leave your employer. If you're terminated or laid off or you just have to quit um, for some reason, usually you have 63 days to enroll in COBRA. Typically when you leave your company, your company t gives you the information to enroll in COBRA and um, your monthly premiums are the same as that the premiums that your employer paid, but now you're paying them. And so they can be quite expensive. Five, six, seven hundred dollars is pretty common. Um, you can keep COBRA. The typical amount is 18 months. A year and a half after you leave, you've got uh, COBRA. There are occasions when you can ask for extensions and get it up to 36 months. So you'll have to check um, with the coverage. Um, and, and typically, you'll want to check as soon as you begin COBRA. If you know, say, hey, I'm all of a sudden I need this heart transplant, uh, you'll want to check with your employer right then and say, can I request an extension now? Because if you wait until the 18th month, they may not let you. So um, you want to start that at, at the beginning. So do you guys have any questions at this moment? You're supposed to ask something. Mary. <laughs> A lot of the um transplant patients that I uh, go to pulmonary rehabilitation with um, are on social security disability. Mm -hmm. Never even occurred to me to do that. Um, they didn't seem to have any trouble doing it and, and then once they got on social security disability then they became eligible for Medicare. Can you explain more about it? When, when that would be appropriate and how you would do it? Yes, so Mary has asked about Social Security Disability and Medicare, how you go about applying for disability and when you decide, should I apply, uh, um, essentially. Uh, so the most important thing is if you need a transplant, you're probably going to qualify for disability. Again, this is totally up to your physician number one and then Social Security number two. There's a form when you go on to uh, the Social Security website, and um, that's just www.ssa.gov, G-O-V. You can go onto that website, and or you can call your local Social Security office and ask them for the disability information. Uh, there's a packet that you actually have to complete. Once the packet has been completed, at that time, you will, um, send it back into Social Security. This packet asks usually about your work history. It wants to know, okay, have you worked in your lifetime? Has your spouse worked? How many times have you been married, divorced? I mean, they want to know everything about you. Um, so you have to send that in. Then they send another packet to your physicians. So you have to give them your physician's information. And they will, um, the physicians have 30 days to complete their portion of your disability packet and included would be any medical records. Um, and it's every single physician you've seen for like the last five years that you can think of. So for transplant specifically, um, you would go into you know, your pulmonary physician or your cardiologist or kidney or liver uh, physician. And at that point, um, they send it back into Social Security. Social Security then decides, they go through your information and decide okay, does this person meet criteria for disability? Typically, if you are a liver patient or a uh, lung patient, you will qualify for disability almost immediately if you need a transplant. Um, kidney patients are different because they're on, they, re, they receive Medicare because of end-stage renal disease, so I'm going to exclude kidney patients from this. They have the same rights. They can apply for disability, but theirs is a little bit trickier. Um, the other one that's tricky is heart. A lot of people have heart attacks and they think, oh well, gosh, I can go in and, and fill out disability. Well, a lot of people know that you can have a heart attack and be back to work. Um, if you're a heart transplant recipient or waiting for a heart transplant, that's much more uh, significant and serious than just a heart attack. But a lot of times Social Security doesn't see that. So sometimes Social Security will actually deny the benefit and then you have to appeal it. Sometimes people get attorneys. Um, there are a lot of ways that you can go about it, but yeah, it's definitely something I would recommend and um, I mean if you're 65 or over, you should be receiving Social Security. Uh, it may not be important, but if you're under 65, definitely, if you're waiting for a transplant, I would absolutely apply for disability. 
the one caveat to that is if you are under 65, um, you're waiting for a transplant, but you still want to work. Um, you can't receive disability and still work. That's so you've got to kind of decide how sick am I? Can I continue to work? Once I get transplanted, will I be able to go back to work? You know, at that point you need to kind of decide, okay, should I apply for disability? And you can call Social Security and talk to uh, somebody with, within the disability uh, area and kind of get the information as far as what, what is the best plan for my medical condition. Um, there are some very specific attorneys and then there are some specific nonprofit organizations that actually help people apply for disability as well and you can call them they they probably have fees that they would charge but it's something that you would want to look into I suppose so that's a very good question thank you Michelle yes um, I was I called Social Security to get my part B which I did and it was effective at July 1st and then I asked them about the disability and the woman that I had talked to said how, what date did I get here and I told her June 7th was the first date and um, she put me down as that date so if later on because my goal has always been to be back to work but sure. I also have to be realistic about it and it looks like now more time is going by and I may not be able to right so but I haven't received the paper, I haven't gotten any paperwork on disability. Would you suggest that I call and ask for this? Being so, she's already has it in the computer that I've you know, requested it and put down June 7th as a date. Yeah. So there won't be any waiting period. Yeah, so um, your question is, is I, you're now, let me, let me just kind of understand. Are you receiving, do you have Medicare now at this time? Yes. Okay. So you should be on disability at this point anyway. Are you, are you receiving she social security? She just turned 65. You just turned 65. In March. Okay. So, um, so you're in a very unique situation. Um, this person has just turned 65, so she is now entitled to Medicare because of age. Um, the question is, should she also apply for disability? So um, that's kind of a tricky question because you are entitled to Social Security benefits now that you can request and start receiving. Would you actually receive more if you were receiving Social Security disability? That's what I, that was my question. Okay. Because now I have uh, Social Security Part A and B, B yeah. effective as July 1st. Okay. So, so you'll want to contact Social Security and ask them because when you receive your Social Security statements every quarter, there is a difference between what you will receive if you elect to choose, uh, elect your Social Security at age 65 versus 67. There, and then there's a side that says, if you're 65 and disabled, you'll receive this amount. Is this amount greater than just your Social Security? So I would recommend contacting Social Security and finding out, am I gonna get more by requesting Social Security disability? If the answer is yes, then maybe take it. If the answer is no, I wouldn't because you're still going to be able to get Social Security anyway. If you decide to go back to work now that you're 65 after your transplant and you have disability, you would lose the disability benefit, but you could still elect to take Social Security because of age. Right. And yes. then the other question I had, I also have um, a uh, PERS, you know, with the mm -hmm. school district. Now, I I've, I've was told that I can't collect Social Security as well when I'm collecting PERS, and, which doesn't sound fair, but I guess that's the legislator. Is, so PERS is something specific to Nevada. We don't yes. have that here in Utah. Right. Um, so what you need to find out is, uh, is that part of your retirement? It's your public employee retirement right. supplement. Okay, so typically with any sort of retirement you can start collecting at 65. Um, if you're still working, they may keep it in there until you retire. So I would talk to them. I think that uh, legally you would have the option to start taking that now that you're 65. But Either they may say- I retire? Yeah, they may say you have to wait until you retire. Yeah. Um, and I don't know that as much, uh, uh, just because it's a well, different state. it might state. be a good idea if once I retire, I won't get Social Security. Yeah. Well, you should. Money. I yeah. Mean, I have yeah. the benefits, but. Um, so 
my question to you is, did you pay into Social Security dirt while you were working for, were you a state of Nevada employee or are you a district, like a school district employee? I'm a school district employee and they do not take out Social Security, but I have money in Social Security. Okay, so that's unique. Okay, so most, most people pay into Social Security, right? Some people, depending on where you work, um, a lot of churches, a lot of state um, and federal jobs, prior to like, I believe, it, I, I don't know the exact date, but it was like in the 80s sometime. 82, yeah. 1982, so yeah. you know better than I. Uh, a lot of people had the option to pay into their own retirement system rather than paying into Social Security. So that's something that I, I wish I could answer. I don't know all of the answers to. Um, but if you did that, then you probably wouldn't have Social Security as much based on, on your state employee retirement plan. If you were married and your spouse paid into Social Security, then you would be entitled to both because you should be able to get Social Security through your spouse because That's, that person yeah. worked. So I would definitely um, ask the state about that and then also um, talk to Social Security about that. If that makes sense at all. Yeah, so. it's just starting to get confusing now that at this point because I'm not quite sure what I'm entitled to and what I'm not. Yeah. And you're confusing me now too, so it's okay. <laughs> so, so. Yeah, I, it is unique because <laughs> we see that here in Utah. We actually see that quite a bit because a lot of them, a lot of people work for um, one of the churches here locally, and they they didn't pay into Social Security either until after '82. So they didn't pay anything, and then all of a sudden they started paying into Social Security exactly. at some point. So, yeah, well, it is. Michelle uh, was the one that she had suggested to check into disability, and she's been just great because I've followed her um, suggestions, and thus far have just been perfect Good. because I wouldn't have known like the Part B. Good. Um, and that really worked well, but now I'm a, now I'm a step further, and I'm not yeah. quite sure, so. Okay. Good job. Rochelle. Rochelle. Rochelle, yeah. <laughs> Rochelle, Michelle. Uh, any other questions? Great. Yes, Larry. Question on veterans and also being on TRICARE. Okay. And you can still go Ooh. to the VA hospital Yeah. Or, or, or not? Okay, so question. If you're a veteran and you have TRICARE, um, do you have VA benefits? There's a difference between being a veteran and having VA benefits. Um, you could have served for, for the country for two or three years but never served any wartime and you may not be entitled to VA benefits. You may have served for 20 years and you would be fully entitled to VA benefits. So yes, as a veteran, you have the ability to go to the VA hospital and be treated um, for anything that they treat. They, um, if you have TRICARE, the VA hospital can bill TRICARE, but because they're kind of one and the same, uh, they don't bill you necessarily, they just bill the insurance and they deal with the insurance. Most people that have TRICARE um, will actually go to a, you know, a regular hospital that's not affiliated with the, the VA and they'll use their TRICARE benefits. And, um, and then you may have a copayment along with that. But yes, you can use the VA hospital also. Um, that, and that actually brings up a good point. If you have Medicare and TRICARE, you would never want to enroll in a Medicare Part D prescription plan because the, what TRICARE offers is better. And as soon as you enroll in a Medicare Part D prescription plan, you lose your TRICARE uh, pharmacy benefit. So don't ever do that. So um, does that kind of answer your question? Yes. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, I think that's all. Thank you. All right.